So, obviously we're talking about godfathers of the cocktail movement. Uh, we're just looking at the American ones for this one. There are obviously some great international godfathers. I think on the left-hand side, Dick Bradsell from the UK, very significant within London. In the middle, Charles Schumann from uh, Munich in Germany, who is perhaps alongside with Dale, the only person who really looks like a godfather in all of these things. <laughs> and finally on the right, Maestro Salvatore Calabresi. I say, I think those would be three examples of international ones. Because obviously my choice of godfathers can be seen as, you know, I can be seen as perhaps not necessarily controversial. If I'd had a bigger panel up there, I probably would have had uh, Murray Stenson as well as a, a fourth godfather. <laughs> But also, we're not talking about modern godfathers. A lot of people sort of said, ah, oh, but what about this person? What about that person? And who knows, maybe I think these four could be sitting up there in 20 years' time. There are others, of course. But what I really wanted to do was people who were influential actually did it back in the day. And these three guys did it back in the day. And, you know, they were either sources of information or sources of inspiration or just great places to get drinks and really did what a lot of us aspire to do nowadays. So for those who don't know them, the three that I chose, obviously, firstly, Paul Harrington, also known as The Alchemist. Uh, the picture in the middle was from the website hotwired uh, forward slash cocktailtime.com, and that was literally the best picture he had of himself from that era. <laughs> but as to why The Alchemist and why this was so important, well, for me, I started bartending in, well, started bartending in New York in 1993, don't tell the immigration people, but in those days, my owner, not a very good owner, but was very big into new media, and he introduced me to the internet. I got an email address. I think I was the only person I knew who had an email address other than him, so that was a bit weird. Uh, but when the bar was a bit quiet, I used to go upstairs and start using this internet thing to do a bit of research. And I stumbled across this incredible website called cocktailtime.com. And this was really important because it was the first time that I'd actually seen that cocktail recipes weren't just recipes. They actually had stories behind them. They had histories. And the drinks he was choosing were drinks like the Aviation, the Monkey Clan, the Peyu Club, the Red Snapper. And this was such an incredible source of, of information for me to give me something to talk to guests about. Because remember, back in those days, people weren't overly impressed by the wonderful cocktails you made. It was how heavy your pour was and whether you could remember their name and things like that. But this site was hugely influential and for a lot of other bartenders as well. This was really a virtual godfather. Jacob Breyers popped in earlier and had to come up and shake uh, Paul's hands because he said, well, I'm sitting in New Zealand. I found this website and it really was this sort of link to realizing there were other people around the world who cared about drinks and not just the effect of drinks as well. So obviously, worked at Townhouse and Enrico's, bartender in residence, author of an incredible book, which is out of print and as far as I'm aware, will stay out of print for some time. So it's about $100 a copy if you can find it. Well, I'm happy to sell you 75 cash. Come up to see me at the end for that. Uh, and now, as I say, although he was an architect, and as he says, this book was actually to sort of put a tail on his bartending career, he's now for some reason got back into it on the ownership level and now runs Clover up in Spokane. So as I say, Mr. Paul Harrington. <laughs> Second, Brother Cleve, obviously on the left-hand side in his earlier incarnation as a street musician. In the middle, getting into cocktails, and now I think that's a mixography, not mixology nowadays, mm. but still. <laughs> I do worry slightly that it's the same shirt you're wearing in both of those pictures, but still. It still fits after 20 years. <laughs> but, but again, I, mean, I was very lucky that I came, I came to Boston. Actually, while I was up there, I was introduced to this strange figure, Brother Cleve. I didn't realize how lucky I was, because by meeting Cleve up in Boston, I was immediately sort of grandfathered in. I was a legacy now in every single bar I went to. It's, oh, you're a friend of Cleve's? Immediately. Free drinks, you know, do what you'd like, etc. Brother Cleve. <laughs> and finally, you can't run a session on American bartending and Godfathers without talking about King Cocktail, the Da Vinci of drinks, the Yoda of mixology. And truly, with this, the Capo di Tutti Capi. In what I think of some of my more amusing times, I have referred to you as the bastard love child of Tony Bennett and Martin Scorsese. <laughs> but the list of your accomplishments goes on and on, and I remember spending my 26th birthday, which was obviously a long time ago in the Rainbow Room. I don't think I knew you then, but became aware of you after that, and I remember going and writing or interviewing you for Class Magazine, seeing your wonderful library of books, which again made me realize that there were other great books out there that I could buy, beg, borrow, and steal. I think you made my first Sazerac as well, as we were sitting in the Rainbow Room, totally alone, looking over that incredible view. Since then, we've continued on, whether it was work at the Match Bar, where you were director of drinks. Obviously, as a 
global guru for world class. And as I say, your accomplishments absolutely speak for yourselves in terms of James Beard's awards and life accomplishments. And I'm so proud to have you on the session. So Dale DeGroff. Thank you. So obviously what I tried to do was, I tried to, I want to give them an opportunity to just talk about things that they were interested in, but we needed to get some sort of uh, structure to it. So I phoned up and interviewed them and recorded them and things like that, and I've tried to distill it down into groups of thoughts and information. We'll give them all a couple of minutes to talk about each little sort of section, and then as I say, leave a decent section for you guys at the end to ask your questions to it. So, first off, I'd say early stirrings. We have bartender, bar, uh, former bar owner, we have musician, we have an architect. Obviously, none of you necessarily grew up wanting to be bartenders, so I think maybe over to Paul to start off with in terms of how did you get into it? So after my 21st birthday, I took one bartending shift. It, it was called Charlie's Bar and Grill in Bellevue, Washington. It was a nightclub. I'd been the, I'd been the bar back there for, I guess, so between May and August, uh, so about three months. And only one patron came in that day, ordered one drink. It was a Manhattan. Uh, I don't even know how I knew what a Manhattan was, but I made him a Manhattan and went about, went about cleaning up the bar and asked him how it was. He said it was great. So I sort of thought, well, I guess I must be a bartender. <laughs> uh, yeah. Moved back to San Francisco about two weeks later, took another job as a waiter, became a bar back, and then uh, at Hulahan's on Fishman's Wharf, a big chain restaurant, making woohoo cocktails and peach punches, and became the bar manager there. And uh, in, in managing that, I ended up training a gentleman named Tom Southwell, who was one of the original uh, bartenders at TGI Fridays. And in training him, he's the one that taught me that there was uh, a respectful way to make, to make drinks, regardless of how ridiculous the drink was. There is a recipe there. You follow it for cost reasons, portion reasons, the fact that it tastes better when you use a recipe. And he just, he became a sheriff, I believe. Uh, he was sort of a tightly strung guy. We didn't really see eye to eye on that, but he did treat me to respect the bar and to uh, respect making drinks, so that was my cool. start. Nice. Uh, Cleve, how did, you, how did you get into bartending and drinks? When I was eight, my grandmother gave me her Manhattan and said, have a little sip of this. Right. I'm not, I mean, move away from that, thank you very much. Don't be responsible. That's good. Sorry, Matt. Sorry. So uh, as, a, as a young punk rocker in the 70s, I was at the, the Rat, which was the club in Boston that I used to play out a lot, and I always drank Manhattans. And the bartenders there were like, you're the guy with class. You got class, kid. Everybody else is just drinking Budweiser, but you're drinking Manhattan. So I always loved Manhattans. Um, and in 1985, I joined a band called the Del Fuegos. They were signed to Warner Brothers. And I went on my very first US tour. And uh, about three days into the tour, we were in Cleveland, Ohio. And I went to a place which uh, I have later found out from people from Ohio that was called Shorty's Diner. And uh, the back cover of the menu said, try a refreshing cocktail. And it had 100 drinks on there. And I looked at it and said, wait a minute, there's only like 20 cocktails, right? What the hell are all these other things? What the fuck is a sidecar? <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, left there, and there was a bookstore. And I went in, and I bought an old Mr. Boston bartending guy. And I got fascinated by all these old drinks. And I was trying to find a lot of these spirits. And I was like, what the hell is Creme de Vet? You know, where do you find these things? So I, I was fascinated by it. And uh, three years later, when the band broke up, a friend of mine was opening a bar in Boston. And he said, want to be a bartender? I said, yeah. hell yeah, OK, sounds good. And the first day at the bar, I put up a sign, today's special, sidecar. <laughs> my, nice. And my first customer came in and said, what the fuck is a sidecar? <laughs> I said, why? It's brandy, quattro, and lemon juice. He said, all the Bud Light. And it kind of went like that. Uh, we struggle for our arts, don't we? Uh, Dale, how did it start for you? Um, I I actually uh, saw the movie West Side Story in Indianapolis, Indiana when I was 13 years old, and I really wanted to be a jet. <laughs> I wanted to have a thin black tie and a purple shirt, and I wanted to live in New York City. And that was my dream. I didn't have any more ambition than to get to New York City one way or the other. And I did. And uh, upon arriving in New York, it took about 13 seconds to figure out that the only place you wanted to be in New York was in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just the most interesting place and the most comfortable place. Since my apartment was about as big as this table, probably a little wider, maybe. Um, and we 
my friend and I who are sharing, sharing this apartment. <laughs> we're uh, lucky because his older brother was a hot dog in the advertising agency, and I'm sure his mother had called up and said, you give those boys a job, Ronnie. <laughs> so he gave us a job in the mailroom. <clears throat> and what he was actually was an Olympic drinker. And he had the account, Restaurant Associates, which was a, the supreme account that every advertising in New York City a, agency wanted. And these were the original Mad Men guys, and they, they missed the whole humor on the TV show Mad Men. These were the funniest men I ever met in my life. And they, were, they could all be stand-up comedians. The best jokes in the world started in advertising agencies and went around the world. And <clears throat> anyway, they taught me the ethics of the bar, how to order stuff, what to order when and why, and all that very early on. And I, you know, you could drink at 18 when I arrived in New York and I was 19. So that, that was, that, and that, now my intention was to become an actor. You saw that goofy portrait all the way over on the, yeah, well that was my acting portrait. And <clears throat> finally when I got out to tending bar and I got out to Los Angeles, still harboring the, uh, the dream to become a, a movie star, <clears throat> I was working at the beautiful Hotel Bel Air. God knows how I got this job. I had no clue. Uh, but I, I realized when I got there that I really had to focus. And so I started tasting everything behind the bar. I hadn't seen any of those products before. And the piano player, whose name was Bud Herman, had played with Benny Goodman. And um, <clears throat> Bud and I became friends when I got the night shift. And he said to me one day, <clears throat> says, Dale, you know, I know you're really into this acting thing. But um, you know, you got a knack for bartending. That's all he said. <laughs> well, when both of my sons were born, I realized that knack really better pay off because <laughs> show business wasn't. <laughs> and I went back to New York City, and, but I had the good fortune of always having a great job. It was just serendipitous. I walked into incredibly beautiful locations where I learned a lot while I was there, and the second phase of that was to go to work for Joe Mom, and that just changed my career. Cool. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> <laughs> And I suppose I mean, the next question is, was there a, an aha moment where suddenly everything seemed to make sense and you said, right, I can make money out of this or career or I love doing this or, you know, piece of advice you got given or something like that? Paul, was that... that? So for me, there were a couple aha moments. Uh, one was being introduced to Dale DeGroff uh, through mutual friends. He had some college friends that owned a restaurant around the corner from my bar. One friend said, oh man, my friend from New York, he'd love, he'd love this bar. He'd love what you do here. Like, oh, who's your friend? He's like... Dale DeGroff. I was like, wow, you know Dale DeGroff? <laughs> and that was, you know, again, we didn't have Facebook. We didn't have, this was real, you know, real networking. So uh, that was Evelyn Sloman's her name. And uh, so anyway, he came out and visited probably some, I don't know if it was in fall or probably in the fall. He came out and visited him and sat at the bar. And uh, I remember he walked in. I had to go back in the cooler because I was just like shaking. Like I was so <laughs> uh, to make this man a drink. Uh, and uh, I think he asked me then, uh, what have you been working on? And I didn't really have much to say. He ordered a martini. Uh, well, first he ordered a quarter cup of olive oil to <laughs> soothe his stomach, and then a martini. So I made him a martini. And they went out the rest of the night drinking in San Francisco and uh, came back about 2.30 to our bars. I was wiping off the counter, and he got on the I piano. I remember this part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 2.30 in the morning, well, so you were over This is my aha moment, so you better. <laughs> 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 well, so anyway, he came back, and he, I mean, he said, I mean, as many of you who have met Dale or spent any time with him or talked to him, he's a very gracious man, and uh, he said, you know, that martini was the best drink I had tonight, so I took that to heart, and so I'd say that was my aha moment. Yeah. Uh, another one was a chance to meet Charles Schumann when I was in Munich, and so there were a couple events like that in my life where bartending was not a career then, but it sat well with me. It's like, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm in this network of people. There's a reason, there's a bigger reason, you know, so I think I was sort of, for cool. whatever reason, starts Dale? online. I did, I, I, you know, I got a, a waiting job at Charlie O's, which was a, a, <clears throat> a Joe Bon invention. Uh, it was one of his most successful bars, and it was in Rockefeller Center. It was uh, just a, a lively, raucous New York bar, bar and grill, classy and divey at the same time. It was just such a great place. I mean, you never knew who was going to walk in, and they used to have the big St. Patty's Day breakfast there when they would bring in the mayor and the bishop and everybody. You know, I think Bobby Kennedy announced for the presidency in there. It was just a big place, and it was open for a long, long time. And I finished my weight shift in the, <clears throat> in the lunch shift, and, and, the, and the manager just at her wit's end. By this time, it had been sold, and it was owned by a, a 
Peter Ashkenazi, whose daddy was a big shot in the, in the garment district and gave a lot of money to the Mayor Beam, who was Mayor Beam, aging myself completely now. And uh, we had the contract to do all the parties at Gracie Mansion and they needed a bartender because the two Irish bartenders who I learned from, by the way, later, behind the bar had no interest in this. It meant loading a truck, then unloading it, then loading it, and you know what I'm saying? And they had no interest in The money they made behind that bar was so good. And they were union, they didn't have to take this job. So off I went as a waiter. First I stopped up at the, I lied. I said, yes, I'll, I can do that. I can I can turn that bar. <clears throat> and so I went up to Mike, and I said, Mike, on the index card, eight drinks, please, eight. He says, don't be silly. You're, 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 Dave, you're not going to need it. You're not going to need it. They're going to ask for a, a tab and, and, and Chardonnay. You know, don't worry about it. He says, no, really, please, just write some down. So he wrote down whiskey, blah, blah, blah. Of course, I didn't use any of them. So I get up there, build my little bar, look just like this. Uh, and um, <clears throat> Rupert Murdoch was being given the keys to the city. So, <laughs> and uh, I attended bar and I felt better and better as the evening went on and I'm feeling really good and, and I'm making the tabs and the Chardonnays and the vodka rocks and the scotch and sodas and I'm thinking, this stuff is easy. And I felt like really good back there. I said, this is what I wanna do, man. I felt like, I don't know how mom had Ali felt when he first stepped in the ring, but I thought, wow, man, this is cool. And I go back and I end up like a week later getting the service bar job from Mike, which meant the window over here where you didn't get to take care of any customers except for one guy who happened to be next to the service window that Mike couldn't get to in time. And um, flash forward many years, I'm in Soho in a duplex apartment owned by Rupert Murdoch, working his birthday party. And I said, <clears throat> Mr. Murdoch, I, this is after the party got going, Mr. Murdoch, he walked up and said, oh, you're the hot shit cocktail guy. I said, uh, <laughs> really. and I said, actually, Mr. Murdoch, um, our, our fortunes rose together in this city, and I told him the story. Relatively, <laughs> anyway, yeah. that, My aha moment was that, that day at, at Gracie Mansion. Fantastic. And, uh, and uh, Cleve? I think um, when I, I always liked bars, and I always liked bartenders, and I always hung out with bartenders that, were, you know, they, they made sense to me. They were great guys to hang out with. They could talk about anything, they knew a lot. So when I finally, you know, in 1988, got behind the bar myself for the first time, I realized that, well, I'd been in sh show business for uh, you know, 10 years or so at that point, and I realized it was like the exact same thing. You're on stage. And that was what I, when now I was back there, I realized what, I had admired about these other people that had done this bef you know, before me, that I had, had unconsciously learned a lot from them. And that was the aha uh -huh of like, oh yeah, okay, this is, I'm on stage. And that was like, oh, okay, so what is the difference between doing this and playing rock and roll? Uh, okay. I didn't have four other guys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, as I say, I mean, all three of you, didn't necessarily grow up wanting to be bartenders. Nowadays, of course, you, know, you no longer get asked, not you, but bartenders in general, what else do you do or what's your proper job? Bartenders are now mixologists and cocktailians, drink smiths, bar chefs, intoxicologists, spiritual technicians, and things like that. <laughs> but it was that idea that there are now people who grow up as such wanting to be bartenders, that it's seen as a proper career, like a sommelier and a chef and things like that. And I just wondered what you guys thought briefly about people who grow up wanting to be bartenders. Are these people deeply broken? Uh, or, as I say, are they the future? Are they the future? I think it is the future. I think, uh, I mean, there's many jobs like that. I mean, I don't know, we're not going to get into the economics and the state of our country and everything else. But, no, the, it's a legitimate industry now. Well, you know, when I bartended, for whatever reason, I decided I'm going to do this till I'm 30. I, you know, I'd gone to school. I worked my way through school. It was a great social life. You know, it was like being a rock star. It just made, it made sense. Uh, and that's a, I mean, so, but now it is a legitimate business. And there's, there's good, what, there, there's more money in the business, as you mentioned earlier. There's more opportunities. I think, you know, all of our careers have been extended probably because of being bartenders 20 and 30 years ago. Uh, so, no, I think it is a legitimate career choice now. Cool. Uh, for good or for bad, I mean, I think there's, but to be a true bartender, I think, you know, I live in a small rural community that we spend a lot of time out at country roads, you come across a bar and you find someone there that 
they don't have any of these ingredients. They don't, you know, they might, you know, they're lucky if they have cold beer. But there's still some great bartenders out there, and you know, those people don't come here and do that, but those okay. people, so. Definitely. Dale, how do you feel about the, the modern professional bartender, the <coughs> career bartender? It, it is, in fact, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it, it is, in fact, a, a very good place to go. Uh, if, if, and you can go in a lot of different directions. Um, there, there's mid six figures to be made if you handle your cards right. I mean, there are a lot of corporations out there right now that need uh, beverage professionals at the highest level. And, and those are guys who know more than I do. They know everything about wine. They know everything about beer and sake and, and cocktails and, and, thing, and, th and service and, and restaurants and whatever. They know it. And so those guys, and they're, they're sitting in this room, some of them are, are eminently employable by these, you know, very large uh, mid to luxury level chain restaurant groups or, or luxury hotel groups. Um, I see now where the... The Shager Group, uh, uh, Ian and, and the Marriott Group are coming together for some projects. I mean, those people need guys like you big time, and you can make big money. Now, if that's what you want to do, if you want to make big money, you can actually do it as a bartender now, and you couldn't, you couldn't make that kind of money as a bartender before. But if you want to, you know, be on the more spiritual route, as it were, uh, you know, you can do what people like Sean Kenyon are doing. He has his couple of bars. He loves the people he works with. He nourishes them. He trains them. He's an incredible employer. He's happy doing what he's doing. He's never going to make, you know, mid six figures probably. Or maybe he is now, damn it. Sean? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that's another route, you know, have a couple of bars and be happy, make a really good living and, and raise a family. Nice, you know. Uh, so, so there's any number of routes you can take in this, in, the, in, in these choices. But, the, the, of course, the, the primary thing you have to uh, ask yourself when you step into this role is, do I like people? Mm. Well, I say, I mean, everyone says, you know, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I mean, this really is, you know, it's a people business, an experience business. Let's move on. Let's talk about old cocktails, because all three of you are renowned for either resurrecting old cocktails or really championing classics rather than necessarily crazy signatures and modern drinks and things like that. So just a thought about what intrigued you or what made you so interested in these older cocktails. So, Cleve? Just the fact that there were so many of them that I had no idea. You know, I, like I said, I drank Manhattans and uh, Old Fashions and uh, Rob Roy's, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, martinis. Uh, in Boston, where I lived, there was a group of people that would, in the 80s, that would start to, were having cocktail parties. And uh, it was a very punk rock thing. I, my, my friend, the millionaire, uh, who uh, was the leader of the band Combustible Edison, uh, and, uh, which Paul had the, that's how we <laughs> met through uh, that. Uh, but he said, you know, getting into cocktails was the most punk rock thing I could ever do because nobody did it and nobody <laughs> drank them. And it was like going to a bowling alley or a drive-in <laughs> movie theater or something like that. As all those things were dying out at that time in the, in the 80s, um, there were people that would have these cocktail parties and dress up kind of like I am today and, uh, you know, listen to easy listening records and tiki music and Martin Denny records and things like that and uh, pretend that we're all sophisticated even though we're just a bunch of goddamn punk rockers. But, uh, Dale, uh, I mean, as I say, classic cocktails, you were known for you know, Irish coffee, Capri Bulo, things like that. Uh, the balance between classics, forgotten classics and modern classics. Well, the, uh, the, the, my, my route into the classic cocktail, of course, was Joe Bomb who said, I want, a, I want a 19th century bar at the Rain Room, and that was all I needed to hear. And I, I, I wanted the gig real, real bad, and so I, I went to work at it. And uh, <clears throat> obviously, uh, that mixed with going back to the original recipes and the, and the fresh juices and all that uh, made a nice little package. Uh, I didn't even think about signature cocktails for a while. <clears throat> I, was, I was having a hell of a time trying to figure out how to do the classic ones. You know, for, for, first for four bartenders in a small fine dining restaurant, but then for 34 bartenders, I mean, how to teach these guys how to even do these drinks this way that hadn't, because they all came from guns, they all came from sour mix, and, and <clears throat> they all had their, you know, that background. So it, it, was, it was really not about, oh, I think I'm going to come up with a cocktail of a day for the next week, you know. No, there wasn't time for that. <laughs> you know, there was just time to get, I got my first menu out uh, at the Rainbow Room 
and it was a disaster. I mean, it was, I had 26 of the hardest drinks to make ever. <laughs> and these guys had never made them before. And all of a sudden, there were nine deep at the bar. And every night, we had no, we had no easy opening. There was no soft opening. We opened the doors, and it was thousands of people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I, I took the first menu out after six months, which really pissed you off, because it cost a fortune. It was Milton Laser, Glazer Graphics, glossy, everything. And I'm, I'm ripping it out of service after we've only been open for a couple of months. And Joe's like, Jesus Christ, Dale. We spent a lot of money on this thing. You know, and I'm like, but it's not working, Joe. And Joe hung in with me, and it took us a year to make it work, but it eventually worked. And it was, I'm right in thinking it was Joe who told you to go out and find uh, the Bond Vivant's companion. And you spent time completely yeah, until somebody pointed out. He said, go find this book by uh, Jerry Thomas. It's called The Bond Vivant's Companion. I went to bookstore after bookstore. The SOB never told me it was written in 1862. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. I had no clue. They didn't have it at Barnes and Noble, did they? <laughs> and uh, Paul, I mean, you were writing about monkey glands, 20th centuries, leap year cocktails, <laughs> pay goos. I'm not sure, was there a last word in there? No. No last no, no, word. No but that's pretty word. much, you know, of the current massively fashionable drinks, that was the only one that wasn't in there. So, you know, what, what intrigued you about them? Why did you focus on those? So. Partly was the aha moment with Dale when he asked me what I was working on. I realized I was really working on service and technique and not necessarily recipes. But after that evening, I did start, uh, when I'd go to the library, the, uh, Berkeley had a great collection of uh, antique cook cookbooks and many books. So I would go there and find some of these older cocktail books, photocopy them, take them home at night and read them. And I was, you know, it's... I always say when I was a bartender, when I started bartending in a nightclub, you made Negronis for your bartender friends if you wanted to play a joke on them, and you muddled a kamikaze for them if you really respected them and wanted to make something fresh. So that instinct was there to use you know, fresh juices and, and take care of making the cocktails. But So the first drink I remember coming across in an old Trader Vic's guide was the Pegu, and I looked at it and I said, well, it's just a kamikaze, but we you know, switch out the vodka for gin and add some bitters, which we only had Angostura bitters. That was probably the first one, which in the, you know the next day went into the bar and made it. It's like, oh wow, that's good. So that that was inspiring. <laughs> so then that was my original search was looking for you know drinks that you could promote to people that they would be familiar with. You know, personally, I enjoy spending time with people who drink spirits more than people who drink beer and wine. And so I was trying to build that clientele and get people. I never worked off a menu. This was something I just would offer to people if I thought they would be up for it. And uh, so I, I never had a printed menu back in those days. It was just something I would suggest. And uh, bought a book, a Charles Schumann book, Memories of a Cuban Kitchen, that was had a bunch of Cuban cocktails in the back of it, and the Hemingway daiquiri and the mojito. And they were just fun to make. Uh, you know, in, in architecture school, they teach you, you know, you can do anything with design, but you have to have a reason for doing it. So when I went to bartend, I was like, well, I needed to be a reason. You know, I have to have a reason for making these drinks. And so the classics was an, an, an easy... You know, the, all the ingredients weren't there. So, you know, some, some drinks you couldn't make because you couldn't get the product, but, you know, you'd run across the product at times and you'd make the aviation with, with maraschino. And so that was it. I, f I just found that rewarding. In point of fact, nobody had menus. It wasn't just Paul in that, in that era. The, you went to bars, there were no, there were no cocktail menus anywhere, yeah. you know. <clears throat> well, it's good. Firstly, Dale, this is your cocktail being served. Would you like to tell people what it is? Uh, it's called the Accidental Sour because... Uh, it has an accidental product, or so lore says, uh, the, the Pinot de Chirant, which was accidentally created when a cognac maker dumped some fresh squeezed grape juice into a barrel half filled with cognac because he didn't know it was in there. And he left it alone for a long time, figuring it was shot, and he was so angry, he just put it off in the corner and went about his business. And about a year and a half, two years later, tasted it and thought it was pretty darn good. And that's where, supposedly, I mean, I, I, I've never met that guy. <laughs> and David hasn't corroborated this yet. <laughs> Wondrich, that is. So until he corroborates it, it's still lore. <laughs> uh, and what's I, in it, Dale? What's that? What's in the drink? Oh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, gin. Oh, right. uh, uh, tank Ray, 10, thank you. And uh, uh, that's the main, obviously, ounce and a half shot. Uh, there is a uh, 0 0.25 uh, ounce shot of, uh, of the accidental... Pinot de Charente, and then apricot liqueur, and then a 0.5 of, uh, of, lime, of lemon juice, I'm sorry. 
Uh, this one feels like there's a little bit more lemon than that, but uh, it's it's a uh, batching thing. I think yeah. still, uh, it's hard. It's hard batching because you can't you can't extrapolate out. Sometimes when you multiply out one or another ingredient, especially citrus, mm -hmm. it has to be dialed back and not just extrapolated out. And I find that with batching is something I always stop short in a batching process. If I extrapolate out mathematically, I'll stop short, especially of the sour ingredients, way short of where I thought they should be, and then begin finishing the batch by adding and adding and adding and adding until I get it where I want it, you know? Cool. And that's the only way, really, I think, to do it. Cool. <clears throat> we talked about menu. I mean, you mentioned menus there. I mean, nowadays, you go into bars, and every drink on the menu is an original signature creation invented by the bartenders and things. How do we, how do we feel, as a group or individually, about, let's say, menus where not a single classic drink on the list, they're all innovative new drinks. Hey, what do you think? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to think. Well, you know, I can, all, well, I can always ask for something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it's intriguing now, that because uh, we did go through that period where we, we were go going through all these books and finding these drinks that nobody had ever, you know, had, had, hadn't made in ages, and maybe they'd never even really made them. Like, how many last words were really made in the 19... 20s or teens, mm -hmm. who knows? But uh, the the concept now, I think, is that you a man walks into a bar, or a person walks into a bar and says, "Hmm, what do we have here?" It's the it's the bar and the bartenders who. That's what you go to a bar, a specific bar for, to get those specific drinks. You're not necessarily going to get them anywhere else. So that's what the appeal is of a of a certain bar or a group of bartenders. But uh, individually and collectively, uh, so I, I find it fascinating, actually, because, uh, I, like I say, if I want to have a last word, I can order it, and I certainly hope that every bartender knows how to make that, or a Manhattan, or a Martini, or whatever. But the the idea that you can have something completely original in a place is, I think, it's good. That, that's exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> so we're all set. And yet, I mean, as we said, in the 25 years or so that you know, I started bartending, very few cocktails have made it to modern classic status. I mean, when Cleve was mentioning that period in was it 2006, 2007, when New York neighborhoods, you know, there was a Red Hook and a Cobble Hill and a Green Point, and suddenly every neighborhood had to have its own cocktail. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, is that one of the reasons they didn't become modern classics? Because they didn't travel that well? I mean, again, why so few modern classics? <coughs> Well, how can we tell yet? I mean, we still have to wait about, uh, for a car, it's 25 years mm. to become a classic, right? That's when it becomes uh, vintage, I think. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there are certain classics, I mean, the Bramble, Penicillin. Uh, no, I think Paul Clark pulled it together pretty well in his Imbibe article. I agree. <laughs> he has some really beautiful ideas about what are, what are going to become, you know, the old Cuban. And he m mentioned several of them that we all love to drink and love to make. And I think he hit a lot of them right in the head. And, and there are others in Europe that we're not m that familiar with because, you know, they're Alex's drinks or they're Dick's drinks. I mean, I don't think people know the the uh, the uh, vodka. Well, they know the vodka espresso now. Now that was Dick's drink. I mean, you know, and and that's very popular in a lot of bars everywhere. And he had the Match Spring Punch, and he had. And I think those were sort of you know, they have names that names. Names yep. are so damn important, man, good, I tell you. Your name goes a long way. That exactly. could be the classic right mm. there, that, you know, if you get the right name. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, we're talking about yeah, books. You mentioned photocopies and bookstores and things, which may be rather yeah. alien to people. The internet is, you know, where people are far happier. And obviously, you know, you pulled through, you know, the Hot Wired, which was Wired Magazine's online portal and through Cocktail Time. You really did, you know, you were the virtual godfather and things. How did that come about? So uh, one night in Rico, so I left the townhouse and went to the big city in San Francisco to help open a restaurant and bar, and one night two writers came in, and so San Francisco is notoriously cold in the summer, so their, their article was an ironic article about what's a great summertime drink to have in San Francisco. But I had been reading about Cuban drinks, so that's when we talked, I started talking to Gary and uh, Kate about the mojito and the uh, Hemingway daiquiri. And so for back then, writers were writers and bartenders were bartenders. There wasn't this crossover that we have today. <laughs> but so they loved it. And they ate it up and wrote a, an article about it. Uh, Gary then became the editor of Hotwired. And two of, one of his staff, Laura Moorhead, approached him about wanting to do a cocktail website. Uh, her and her boyfriend at the time, Graham Clark, who were fans of Combustible Edison, uh, wanted to do a cocktail website. They were these punk rockers, not really, but that's what, they were into cocktails like Clee was. 
And so Gary said, great, but you need to talk to Paul Harrington. So by that time, I was transitioning into architecture, uh, but writing a weekly column was actually helped, you know, the young architects don't make any money, I can tell you that. So it helped offset the, that. And it was great, because it was a chance for me just to sort of write down my thoughts about the industry and the cocktails and the drinks I had been making. Uh, so I would meet at the Wired offices once a week. I'd bring satchels of alcohol and make them half a dozen drinks. And initially, we had a, like a group of about 12 writers that would come in. I would tell them what I knew about a drink and to get them started. And they would do the what I thought at the time was great original research. Obviously, now that there's so many cocktail historians, there's many things. But so then we'd meet back, and I'd read the story. And it was a, it was it's a very collaborative effort writing. And so it took about six months to get enough content to launch the site. Uh, and uh, through that time, Laura said, well, you need to write a column. I was like, no, I'm the bartender. I'm not writing a column. But she said, no, you know, this is, and so she helped create this person, the alchemist, uh, and helped me craft words that, uh, she knew what I was saying. She knew what the aesthetic was, what, what I was doing with classic cocktails. And so I don't remember exactly what week we went live, but uh, it was, I mean, it was a lot of fun. It mm. was, you know, at that point, we, I had to, so some drinks didn't make the cut because they didn't have a story. They weren't interesting. It's like, mm. who's going to read about that? Or, you know, and others did. And so that's, that was some of the vetting process, was okay. which ones we could find good histories about. Nice. Uh, and Cleve, I mean, you mentioned when you were about to in Boston that a lot of your clientele were sort of tech people, tech startups. Yeah. And they would, uh, we didn't have smartphones back then, so they would print the recipes, or print the pages from Potwired that with Paul's drinks, and come in and say, <laughs> "Can you make me this?" <laughs> and <laughs> then they brought the book in after that came out, and open a page 200 and said, "Yeah, you get this one or whatever." So yeah, it went, it went like that. For and the website is, as such, as equally out of print as the book is. So it does sit on Chanticleer Society. Yeah, there is. I think. There is a. And yeah. it's actually, yeah, I, I was looking at it in preparation for this, that there is, it's hard to find a link. There's not a direct link to it, but mm. if you, Robert makes some comment about, there's some thread that I'm mentioned in that, hot, that Cocktail's mentioned in, and you can get booze. Well, where do you think I got the pictures from? Thank right. you very much. <laughs> yeah. It still you know, exists, and it's still out there. Cool. You, you All know, right. Laura well. called me, Laura called me when they were writing the book, and, and she said, you know, we're writing this book, and I know you know Paul, and... And this is about the time where I was starting to feel like abused. You know, I, I, I saw stuff happening and I, I had given a lot of information to this one and that one and everything and I thought, well, I gotta make some money on this stuff. No, finally, you know. So when she called up, she said, would you like to donate anything or, or, or would you like, you know, to send some material? I'm like, you paying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry that I did that. So, we're talking about, I mean, obviously, talking about books and things like that. Uh, I often talk about the university of bartending, how bartending is now like a university campus. I don't mean there's lots of young people wandering around drinking incredibly badly and trying to have sex, though <laughs> tail slightly puts me to shame on that one, but still. <laughs> <laughs> but it is that idea that there's such incredible specialization, a history department now, where people are focusing on old-fashioned drinks and styles of things, geography, where they're looking at what's going on in Japan and Spain and things like that, you know, the culinary department, the science department, the art department, the geography department. You're allowed now to sign up and then go and specialize massively. Part of the question, I suppose, is, you know, you all mentioned how important books were you to start books to start off, and the idea of can you learn to bartend from books and how important is that knowledge portion? But also if you were entering into the University of Bartending, which which department now do you think you would probably find yourselves in? Paul? To me and my experience in bars, even now, even with my knowledge, even though I'm not staying current with stuff, I mean it's hard for me to relax in a bar anymore sometimes. So uh, it is about the hospitality and the service and making the guests. The, I mean, we are, you know, I know you don't feel like it, but we're the top one. We're the one percenters, right? Not the ones they're talking about. Uh, but we're the ones that are really the cocktail geeks. The other 99% that buy these products, these people want to relax. They want some conversation. They want a relationship with the bartender. I think that's the part. I mean, enrolling as a student, I might not know that, but that's what I would like to teach. If, mm -hmm. that's what, if, if, the, if that opportunity was out there, that's what I would do. Okay. <laughs> Dale, University of Bartending and books versus real world? Uh, I, I guess the, uh, you know, I, I, I used to think that 
it was the technique, and you know, we came through the rain room doing these classic cocktails that hadn't been done, and you know, we we're how to make this and doing that. But now everybody's so good at this stuff, so it's not that part because everybody's already got it, and they're better than me. Um, I, I think probably uh, the hospitality, but in another, in another way, is is to have bartenders look at it from the perspective of. Uh, being oral historians in a sense, you know that you, you know, bartenders know a lot about everything. They're, they generally have good, good. Uh, they've been a couple of years at college. They have a lot of knowledge about this and that, and other different kinds of things. And they tend to be, if they're good ones, they tend to be somewhat empathetic, and they have all those great qualities. And I think to 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 go that direction and collect stories. I mean, you're, you're interfacing with lots of really difficult, interesting, wild, crazy people over a period of years, and so that's a collection, and it, it really affects you, and it, and it teaches you, and it also gives you the ability to uh, pass that, that accumulated knowledge on in an interesting and funny and entertaining way over the bar. Sometimes, and I don't mean telling tales on people, but I mean just taking some of that and telling tales on people sometimes when they're funny and interesting. Uh, <clears throat> because that's how I get over. But uh, yeah, really. I remember when we talked, you talked about how mean bartenders, you know, there were mean you know, bartenders. Yeah, I think meanness, I honestly think that in 90% of the cases, meanness, which used to be prevalent, you notice that you're not running across that many mean bartenders, people that just have any time for you. It's like, you know, they would ignore you. And you know what that was, in my opinion? Lack of knowledge. They were really embarrassed because they didn't have the knowledge. And so it was just like, you know, that's how we make it here. Or, yeah, you know, if you don't like it, go somewhere else or whatever. It was because they, they were, as things started to become more crafty, they, they were, some of them were getting left behind. And, and, in, in the, and before, there, in fact, there wasn't any craft bartending around. And people who were confronted with situations that they couldn't handle would simply blow people off, because that's the only way they could go. They didn't have the confidence. Confidence is what I think makes you able to be a good host. But it was interesting, you know? literally 10 minutes after you said that, you then said that for some bartenders, knowledge was a, almost a crutch <laughs> that they sort of relied on to... You're a you son know. of a bitch. You know, I, I know, but I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was good, really. Uh, but as I say, I mean, I think there are bartenders, yeah. you know, there are a lot of bartenders out there who know more mash bills than they know Well, jokes, it's not so much that good. they know it, it's just that they want you to know that they know it. Mm -hmm. Too often, too much, you know, and that's, that's as Paul said, they don't care. <laughs> they really don't care. Yeah. I mean, if you find a guest does care, well, then you have that. But yeah. it's about educating. Mm -hmm. You want to know enough. I mean, it's, and with the Internet and smartphones and everything, it's not as important anymore. But, you know... I remember when the first Iraq war, you know, we brought a TV in and sat on the bar and watched, or the O.J. Simpson thing, right? We didn't have a TV in the bar, but we brought one in for those occasions. Mm. Well, you don't have, you know, people could smoke in bars. So we had other things that we could do to keep <laughs> ourselves entertained. Mm. So it is a challenge, and the information's out there. And I've seen guests come in who are smarter than the bartender, too. And that's always, you know, that's when you get the surly bartender, it's like, wow, that person's done their reading. It's an uncomfortable situation, mm. but, I mean, that's what you have faced with. I... Sorry about that. I mean, that wasn't the intent of this or anything else. I mean, what this was about and was, I mean, if you realized what it was like to go in the bar in the 80s, you know, we're way beyond that now. Mm. But. And Dale, I mean, you, you talk about, you know, courses. I mean, I've heard you recommend that people do jazz dance classes to give themselves <laughs> physical <laughs> confidence behind the bar. I, I think having the confidence of the knowledge and then also having the confidence that you are in control of your body and when you shake and when you start, when you walk from one place to another, when you approach the bar, just the way the economy of movement. I had a great bartender who told me that you never approach the bar without making three things happen. You know, you, you don't take an order without cleaning an ashtray. You don't, you don't ever go anywhere at that bar without completing a job, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And you all are all, the, all while you're carrying on a conversation here, here, and over there, you know. So it's, yeah, I mean, they, they, so that, that, yeah, in fact, that physical uh, confidence is really important, I think. Mm. You know? Okay, <clears throat> and staying on the physical to a certain extent, I mean, the idea that we're seeing, especially this week, this idea of wellness, health behind the bar, I mean, this is an industry with many temptations that is very hard physically, emotionally, spiritually, and things like that, and yet the three of you have pretty much got through it unscathed. I'm totally sure about that, but the idea of what is, you know, what is your secret to success? Uh, 
in terms of, you know, not necessarily advice for young bartenders, but how have you managed to get through it and have normal lives? Cleve? We're well, the biggest wreck, why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> It's I'm winner kidding. and still champion. Yeah, just kidding. Um, <laughs> well, I got tuberculosis and I had to stop drinking for four years, so that was good. Uh, that helped. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't die, so here I am. Uh, but I think, um, I don't know, I think, uh, well, consistency is key. You know, Bela Lugosi, who was, played Dracula, he was a heroin addict for 45 years. He quit and he dropped dead. So maybe <laughs> there's a lesson. Let's move away from that one as well. Matt, I'm really don't, sorry, mate. Don't. Really sorry. God, you're killing me here. Nobody Cleve. ever said I was not irreverent. <laughs> Nobody write down, become a heroin addict. Please. No, 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 don't become a heroin addict. No, it's, it's a dumb thing to do. Um, it really is, because it interferes with your drinking. So, no. Um, Step away from this conversation, mate. Step away from it. OK. Uh, I'll, I'll shut up then. I, mean, <laughs> um, I, I had this. I had the good luck of 32 years ago marrying an extraordinary woman. Uh, yeah. Difficult, but extraordinary. Yes. And uh, it, it, every once in a while, I got a, an attitude adjustment from her and a focus. <laughs> and uh, I also got a little focus from my doctor uh, about what am I 65? About 10 years ago. Who, who said to me, uh, you know, Dale, <clears throat> and we did my physical, he said, you've got that thing in the liver, that fatty thing, you know, uh, you'll find out about it one of these days. And uh, he, he said, it's not as, nothing serious. You can actually keep drinking just as much as you're drinking right now. What are you now? And I said, 55. He said, good. You could probably drink the way you're drinking now, and you could hit maybe 70, 75. But <laughs> if you were to stop for a while and let your liver recover, because it will, if you don't go too far, he said, <clears throat> you might make it to 85 or 90. What would you do? <laughs> I quit drinking for about four and, a, four and a half, five years, and it was while I was doing a match bar, and I would go in and say to the bartenders, don't be embarrassed when I spit. And I ordered, uh, the only drink I would order that I would drink a little bit of was a champagne cocktail, so I became the champagne cocktail king in that era. And I didn't drink for about four or five years, and it actually worked. It worked. So, you know, there is ways of doing this. And now I don't drink anywhere near as much as I did. As you notice, I don't go out late at night anymore and do that stuff. And Paul, I mean, you mm. were about under then stopped uh, and now I'm managing or owning a bar and things like that. I mean, maybe seeing it from a slightly different perspective. I mean, either well, so, a secret so or So there's a the health issue. There's also the career issue. So in any career you do, and you know, I have teenage girls down, I try to tell them, you know, choose something that you want to be happy at doing. One wants to be a dolphin trainer and bartender in Hawaii. So if anyone knows any <laughs> openings in that, I'd like to send her there. But so there's that aspect. Make sure whatever you choose to do to make money, regardless of the amount of money, that you're happy doing that. That's going to give you longevity. So from the health standpoint, and so and I'm just, you know, so I'm, what, 47, I think, 46. That's when you know you're old and you don't remember exactly how old you are. <laughs> But just like the last five years, that's when you age. Like up till you're 40, you're pretty invincible, and then you feel it. You're like, oh my gosh! And then you, then your your parents are aging. You you and you start. I mean, you guys all thought 75. Who'd want to live till then? Well, when you get older, you start realizing you might want to live longer or not. <laughs> Ooh, and yeah. so so there are those choices. And you know, even if you <clears throat> go to chanticleers.org and find there's an old alchemist article that article that talks about. You need something outside of this industry, out of this business that keeps you going. So, you know, living in the Bay Area, it was great. There were all these artists and you know, everyone that worked in restaurants and bars had something else that they truly loved doing. And this just fueled the passion for what they were passionate about. A couple of months ago, there was a big debate on Facebook about drinking behind the bar. Uh, very famous potential modern godfather said, you know, it was creepy. People who didn't drink behind the bar or wouldn't drink with a guest when they offered to buy them a drink. Can I ask the three of you, how do you feel, uh, what was your policy, but how do you feel about bartenders drinking behind the bar? Cleve? <laughs> <laughs> I've been that guy. <laughs> but, no, I, I think uh, in, uh, uh, everything is based on timing, and uh, you got to, you know, to have a drink with a guest who is a, you know, a, a a, maybe one of your regulars or someone that you want to treat very nicely to have a share that drink with them is is fine, but don't have ten. Okay, you know, yeah. that works. Dale, yeah. how, did, how did you feel? Well, well, at the Rain Room, you know, we we had these 
beautiful, you know, gabardine jackets, and we were dressed in ties, and we were, and uh, we were working in a place that was, it, it just felt absolutely wrong to drink, you know, I mean, it, it was just wrong, it didn't feel good, I didn't want to do it, something time in a great while someone would say, you know, what, and then they, they would even realize, even saying it, well, I guess not, you know, this is not my neighborhood bar, what am I doing? And that brings up that point. If you own the bar, or if it's your regular neighborhood bar, or if a guy works in a neighborhood bar, the rules are a little different. Come on, let's face it. <laughs> you know, you're going to have a shot of Irish whiskey. Come on. You're a f you, you know you are. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And this, what does your boss think about it? Uh, have you squared that part of it? Cool, so you still have a job. So I think it really depends on that kind of stuff, you know. And you talked about how the Rainbow Room philosophy was the service should be. Yes, Joe's famous line, I, I want my service to be friendly but not familiar. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, for a very fancy place, that makes sense. It, it does make sense. They're paying a lot of money and there's lots of, well, you know, some really wealthy people can be really strange, you know? <laughs> and you have to be careful and just be really formal with, and, and straight ahead with them because that's the kind of thing that protects you if things happen, you know what I mean? You really have to have, to have that kind of reserve sometimes. Uh, and, you have to, and, and even in other places, you, you have to bring that on uh, in certain moments because we all, all react differently to different customers. I don't care if you work in a neighborhood bar or a very fancy place like the Rainbow Room. When people walk in, you change your demeanor according to how the energy is coming at you. You know, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Definitely, Paul, you, you own a bar now. I mean, what's your policy for your bartenders about drinking behind the bar? So, in, in like my bar, like it, it, it's fairly formal for our community. It's very high end for our community, but I wish it was more familiar. So, in, as, so my Paul, well, I'm a horrible owner that way. <laughs> like, because, I mean, all my partners, like, you know, I'm always breaking the rules. Let's put it that way. Uh, when I was a bartender, I set a policy that it was a Johnny Walker red label. If someone wanted to buy me a drink, that's what it was. I either saved that for after the shift or with the patron, depending on what the situation was. Uh, I think in the state of Washington, technically, it's illegal for a bartender to drink mm -hmm. while on the job. Um, I've never had a permit, a license, or anything to do what I do behind the bar. Yeah, we're a little abiding citizens here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like so, uh, but with the, I mean, if it if it if it helps the customer's experience, then I think it's worth it. You know, I think in nightclubs it's a different situation. I mean, building a team when you're four deep at the bar, and you know, nothing's better when the bar back makes a round of shots and puts them in coffee cups, and everyone takes a drink. You know, that's <laughs> that's what gets you through the night. Yeah. So, but. You know, one of the bartenders I worked with when I was a bar back, he'd always want me to take a bottle of Jägermeister out of the cooler, so he'd have to take that home, and he lived till he was 35. So, I mean, yeah. you make it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, cool. So, Lee, Lee, talk to us about the Cocktail Nation. The, so, the Cocktail Nation, we, Ted Hay, who's an old friend of ours, uh, said that the, the spread of the cocktail really helped, was helped uh, by the music side, and the, the bands and this whole sort of cocktail and lounge music thing that happened in the, in the early and mid-90s. And uh, we were at the, the forefront of that. Uh, we were on Sub Pop. Uh, we had our, a drink called the Combustible Edison that was on the, the album cover, uh, which was Brandy and uh, Campari and lemon juice. And Paul had that in, uh, in that too. book. Yeah. Maybe not. Uh, check it. Yeah, check and it. And we got <laughs> we got a Campari sponsorship at that time. And uh, Brandy Campari. Lemon I had been in a band with a Miller Beer sponsorship in the '80s, so yeah. this was a this I thought was a step in the Brandy right Campari. direction for me. Uh, but our, we called our fans the Cocktail Nation, and it started very slowly. We you know we went on our first tour, and we thought, are we going to get killed? <laughs> because we were playing our we were on Sub Pop, our booking agent also booked like Nirvana and Sonic Youth and bands like that. So we were playing in rock clubs, real dumps, and uh, here we were in our matching outfits and <laughs> the xylophone and, uh, you know, <laughs> like, oh, hey, hey. And Miss Lily Banquette, our lead singer, yeah, and uh, we, um, and it, it started out, the first couple of shows, well, there was one song we did where people would always take their clothes off to it. And we said, you know what? I think we're onto something mm -hmm. here. <laughs> uh, but it was, um, 
you'd see like there were one or two people, maybe a half dozen, in, depending on the town, that, that would show up in their fabulous thrift store outfits and be drinking cocktails and got it. And then there were like the two or three guys that would have blue jeans, torn jeans, but a suit coat on, and they would have a cocktail. And then everybody else was just sort of sitting there with a beard going, I don't know what was wrong with those people over there. <laughs> but like it's, well, you speak. know, by the time we got to the West Coast, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, it was like, oh, we're onto something here, aren't we? <laughs> and uh, people totally embraced it out there, and especially Hollywood. Uh, we ended up working with Quentin Tarantino and scoring the movie Four Rooms and did a lot of music for uh, television and advertising, stuff like that. So it, uh, uh, it just kind of worked out very interestingly uh, that way. And, uh, and this, I mean, this was just a desire to sort of resurrect tiki and bowling alleys yeah. and martinis and cocktail parties and hats and bow ties and <laughs> things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was, nice. we, uh, nice. you know, we, we played at tiki bars. We actually, uh, there was a, a short-lived club uh, called Fuzzy Land in Los Angeles that we, we played at that uh, was an old bowling alley. And, uh, you know, they had, they had giant tiki things everywhere and uh, was really a fabulous event. We did a thing called the Exoticon, which uh, Otto von Stroheim uh, did, and Beach Bumberry uh, did the cocktails for. Uh, and it was in the old uh, hotel where Four Rooms was filmed down by MacArthur Park. Uh, and it was uh, just a, an insane event where there were like a couple of thousand people that showed mm -hmm. up and everybody's drinking cocktails. This was 1995. Last couple of things. Obviously, commercialization. I mean, here we are, Tales of the Cocktail, you know, thousands of bartenders, parties, sponsors, and also in your bars yourselves. New products, you know, so many more, so many more jobs and things like that. I mean, the commercialization aspect of the job, shall we say. I mean, is it, do you think it's easier now to be a bartender, or is there so much more pressure financially than there was perhaps in your day? Paul. Uh, from the from just the bartender standpoint, or are you talking about from oh, I mean, as an owner, you must be inundated with people wanting you to stock, you know, 92 different flavors of cupcake flavored vodka and honey oh, so, this. So and, products. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm a, well, I have a small bar. We only have 85 brands, so our shelf space is pretty, you know, I don't know it's, it's a high demand. Mm. And we have a small community that doesn't know most. Of, so, but back to when I was buying and being that managing bartender, I mean, we didn't, I, well, I was always into interesting products, but for me, it had to have a purpose. There had to be an actual application where it improved the situation. So if it doesn't have that, then there's no reason. I don't care how hip they are, how cool they are, how whatever, who they're, where they're shipping you, where they're sending you. It's got to improve the drink or the experience. Dale, I want to say you're... Uh, um, I, I, believe, I believe in the long tail market, especially in the drinks business, because I think there are niche bars for... There are so many products out in the market. You think, well, how will that ever sell? How will anybody ever be? But I think there are, uh, if you have a company and you handle enough of these niche products, there, you know, there will be a home for them. You will find places where you can. It's a lot of work, uh, but <clears throat> I think there, it's like, uh, has anybody ever told us that there's going to be a limit on how many ingredients we can use in food? Mm. <laughs> really? I mean, you know, why should there be? A limit on as long as the and let the market just sort it out. I mean, you know, if stuff is lousy, it's not going to last. I mean, that's all. If stuff is good, and you're able to get it into a niche market, it it can grow. And uh, you know, I, I there's somebody here now who's selling something made from <clears throat> uh, that has no category to fit into, and and it's happening more and more now. Mm -hmm. We're finding spirits that don't fit into categories, and what do you do with those? You know, and they're figuring out how to market and sell those, and that. That to me is is the ultimate challenge, you know, to p place these interesting but category uh, list products, you know. <clears throat> and Cleve, I mean, you talked about how you know you were attracted to bartenders, if that's right, because they were <laughs> cool people to hang out with and funky and things like that. Uh, I mean, do you think, as I say, now that there is so much money awash within the industry and so many careers and companies and livelihoods with new products and craft products, I mean. How do, you, how do you see the difference? It's kind of like being a politician, right? <laughs> there's, there's, always, there's always a backdoor deal that could happen. Uh, I think uh, there's just, there are, bartenders now are the, the ones who 
with new brands, craft brands, et cetera, come up and they, they obviously talk to all of us because they need us to make drinks to get them into the public's hands and mm. throats and everything else there. But uh, <laughs> because you can't, there's so many, like, so many craft drinks spirits now. Like, for instance, in New York, there's a store out in Long Island that, that only sells products that are made in, in the state of New York spirits, beers, mm -hmm. and wines. Mm -hmm. And I was in there last summer, and I thought I noticed that in the spirits category, there was really there was only one product that was under fifty dollars a bottle. And how do you get people to? I mean, the, you could taste spirits at this particular spot, but usually you can't do that. So how do you get people to try these these different products? And uh, obviously, it's what we do. And uh, can that go uh, the you know in certain ways if you're you're getting paid to promote something and you're a bartender and you're, I don't know, you know, there's, there are some ethical issues, I think, but, uh, but at the end of the day, if you truly believe that it's, it's a great spirit or whatever, then I don't see any problem in promoting okay. it. Okay, cool. Uh, very quickly, before we move on to some questions, uh, love. Love and hate. I didn't want to do the grumpy old man thing because that's what I do. Thank you very much. And, uh, you but left me out of that picture. Though. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but Glad you guys. Okay, it was going so well as well. <laughs> very quickly, one thing that you love about the industry at the moment or uh, one thing that you love less? Hate perhaps being a strong okay. word. But. So I would, so Facebook I love. I'm in a small community. I don't, you know, I don't know how many people I'm friends with, or, but I see things. I mean, for this community, for this bartending community, this unique group of people, Facebook is the perfect venue. And if someone, someone should make a bar book or whatever you want to call it for just us, because I think that's, it does help spread the word. And it is a sense of community, because a lot of people probably feel like you're out on an island in whatever little town or whatever, or even in a big city, you probably feel that. So. Cool. The Facebook love. community, I, I do love that aspect of hate? it. Hate? Um, the hate, so... Uh, I told you it every... Uh, the, well, the constant change, but I, maybe that's just me being an old, grumpy old man. That uh, I think some of these changes are good from a regional aspect, and in a large, in a large market, yes, you could specialize in anything. I think there's a, a bakery in New York that just does macaroons. It's like, well, you can't do that in many cities. Mm. But in a big city market, that's going to work. So same thing with the spirits thing. You could specialize in just a spirit cool. or a locally made spirit. Uh, but for me, in a small market, I find it very frustrating because to, con to convert someone to a believer in a small product when it's a large investment, whether it's for a small business or for you know a $50 bottle that's going to sit on the shelf that no one likes is, I mean, it is an investment as a business owner. So Definitely. Dale, what do you love about the industry at the moment? Uh, well, I, 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 there's so much, to, so much to love. I mean, the, 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 the education that's possible for bartenders today is just astounding. Um, the, the number of places, the fact that they can move from country to country, from place to place, and really build a career that way. I mean, the internet has made it possible for, for all of us to travel and work and talk to each other across the world, which is incredible. Ooh, uh, and one thing you hate? You know, um, all of us are so uh, anxious to, to raise the bar and, and talk about that. But then how, how do you, I mean, outside of your own home, what's the point of pouring booze down people's necks? I mean, this is not going to get us anywhere. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't, I don't see that as, as no valuable. No menu backs, taco backs. No, uh, and those luges and the, uh, you know, and all that stuff. <laughs> what is that? Why are we doing that? You know? All right, cool. <laughs> I get it. Uh, it's, it's only good if you're in a spinning barber chair. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Cleve, uh, one thing you love, one thing you hate, please. Uh, I love the fact that I can get a good drink anywhere in the world now, and you couldn't do that 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and what do I hate? I, sometimes I, I look at bar menus and I think, you know what? You're just being too goddamn clever. You pat yourself on the back, like, look what I just did. You know? It's like, come on. Less is more sometimes, you know? Yeah. Cool. Except in tiki drinks. <laughs> All right, so folks, last 13, 40 minutes, questions and answers. Matt, if you could stand up and speak loudly. Oh, wow. Sorry. My voice is still gone. Choose the girl with Larry Joyce. It's my first dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I found that they're kind of like drink archetypes. You know, you have your Manhattan and you have your old fashioned and you have your sour and whatever. And so I've kind of run into this barrier of not being able to create something totally new because it's always just a twist on something. It's this, but just a twist. It's this with an ingredient substitute, you know? Um, do you, and you guys have all created so many, so many of those archetypes, which is awesome, and surpassed those. Do you have a word of advice or just kind of a general approach that helps you be creative outside of the box? So you're asking how to develop a new archetype in drink or what is the next big yeah. thing? Get outside of everything that's already been done. And, see, and to me, a twist on a classic is totally acceptable as long as it fits the situation. So I wouldn't be pushing for the archetype. If you happen to invent the next vodka luge, hats off to you. <laughs> Get yeah. a contract. But I mean, I don't, I don't, so I don't know that there is I mean, that sort of surpass that. Well, surpass it. I mean, uh, that wouldn't be my focus personally. These don't guys, angst over it. I mean, really, guys. if you're if you're learning and using and finding new ingredients all the time, it, it, that'll lead you. I mean, just don't stop. Let your curiosity bring you forward, and don't angst about it. I mean, really, yeah. don't. Creativity will take care of itself. You know. Cool. All right. Another question, sir. So, uh, Brother Cleve, you mentioned uh, local a little bit on the proliferation of craft brands. What are what are your thoughts, um, or any of your thoughts on? Your role in supporting local, whether it's your state or, or your region, as far as craft ingredients or spirits versus the best in the world. If they're good, bring them on. Yeah. You know, if they're, yeah. if they're not good, then fuck them. But I mean, it, interestingly, I read a survey the other day that said 65% of people will put local as more important than taste, which. It right, so seems and, and he's talking about me. people who are under thirty. I think is what it, it was young. It was young people, and that is important. So, so it, it, it has to do somewhat with your business model. As strictly someone who likes to make cocktails, you know, there's so dry fly distillery is I don't know, 800 yards from my front door at the bar, right? And I came down here two years ago as their brand ambassador. Some of their products I love. Some of them there's I wouldn't use. So you just have to. If it has an application, if it betters the drink, use it. If it doesn't, don't force the issue, I would say. So I remember you saying when you set up your bar, you didn't want to have five beers that you had to explain at great length so, to each customer. Okay, so exactly. So we're not, we're not a beer place anyway, but I did pick a local brewery and use just their beers so that, so I do support local. And, but I, I, yeah, I didn't want to have, but everyone's like, well, why don't you support this brewery or support that brewery? It's like, well, because I don't want you standing at a table it's taking three minutes to explain the history of each of these breweries before you take the order and move on. There was an interesting thing on, uh, I don't know where that came through, but basically a restaurant that had done their, you know, nowadays with people's smartphones, with people taking pictures, with all the knowledge, table turn times have like mm. doubled. Yeah. So it has effectively cut your income in half as a, not as a server or as a bartender, but as a business owner, that's a big deal. So mm -hmm. all that information, you pick what you do and do it right, and you'll be fine. Cool. Okay. Folks, another question? Yes. Um, so you all, all three of you have had really successful careers, and you've uh, done a lot of things. I'm sure you've seen a lot of things. I'm wondering if you could mention any sort of specific pitfalls you've overcome, uh, mistakes you might have made and learned from, or personal qualities that got you where you are. Like Dale said earlier, you've got to like people. You know, you, this is a this is a, a hospitality business, and uh, and it is show business, really. And you're on, you know you're on a stage. Dale was a was an actor. I'm a musician. Uh, Paul, an architect and uh, bartender and writer. Uh, so you know you you have to realize that you you have to be able to interact well with uh, with people, and you work long long hours and people don't know that. They don't know that you're in there at two o'clock in the afternoon carrying buckets of ice up three flights of stairs or whatever, you know, uh, and you're in there until three o'clock in the morning or four or whatever cleaning up, so. You know, I think when you're younger, just leave yourself alone and 
screw around for a while. I mean, I, I when I was, I, I didn't really find direction until I was in my 30s, honest to God. I, I did a lot of different stuff. I had so many different jobs. You had no idea. I mean, I really, and and especially living in New York where you, you just took jobs, whatever they were. And um, uh, especially if you were an actor because you, you, know, <laughs> you never got hired. Um, so, uh, you know, don't, uh, unless you've got, that focus so young and you know you want to be a doctor, you know you want to be a lawyer, you know you want to do this, and even that might change. You know, I, I tell young bartenders when I was teaching a lot more than I am now, I would say, just be the best bartender you can right now. I know you don't want to be a bartender, whatever it is you're doing. I don't know. This is early on when nobody really wanted to be a bartender. They were just doing it because they were, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I would say, I would quote John Lennon who said, life is what happens while you're making, pl I mean, uh, while you're making plans. Life is what happens while you're making plans. So just do it, and do it as best you can. And uh, uh, Jean Renoir, when he went to his father, Auguste the painter, and didn't know, came back from the war, didn't know what the hell he wanted to do, and his father said to be a leaf in the stream for a while. Very yeah, I would say be open to opportunities. You never know what's gonna, you know, uh, as you start putting down roots, having families, that, in fact, that's one thing I think find interesting now that some of these brand ambassadors, bartenders are starting to have families. I'm, I'm interested to see how that affects their life, but many are managing it quite well. But along with the other, yeah, be open to opportunities because you never know what's going to walk in your door or, you know. And along with liking people, you need to care about people. Mm. Cool. Folks, any other questions? Yeah. So I work at a pretty high volume bar in Boston. Uh, but I've reached the point at my current job that I'm kind of stagnant as a cocktailer and mixologist and I can't go any further than I've already gone. I just am looking for a little bit of push to go from where I am to where I want to be. Do you have any advice of what I should do to jump from I'm like huge into production, but I love the mixology and the craft, and that's what I ultimately want to do, but I just don't know how to make that step from where I am to where I need to be. Go find a little restaurant that doesn't have a cocktail program and work for them. Got a family? Be careful. <laughs> A lot of us think of the 80s and 90s as the dark ages of mixology or you know, cocktail culture. Are there any components of that time that you think should be retained? So the question was, just if you didn't hear, uh, the 80s and 90s were the dark ages of the cocktail world. I mean, I personally think the woo-woo was a fucking awesome drink. Thank you very much. Made a lot of money over that. But... Uh, as I say, were there any lessons from it? Okay. Big hair. You know, <laughs> I know just, hair. just hair, I think. I, yeah, I, I'll be, I will honestly say that everything important <laughs> I learned about being a bartender, I learned in the 70s. Mm. I mean it. Everything yeah. important, really important from Pat and Mike and people like them, you know. And then the other stuff came later because people had fun in bars then. They weren't like concerned about health or anything else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, you know, we do talk about the cocktail Taliban, you know, that, you know, you have to have a beard, that vodka is evil, that big is bad, that the bar has to have rules. And, you know, there was a time when you didn't even have menus, now you have to have rules, Less. and if you disobey these rules, you know, you're thrown out, etc. Less so, rules, that's good, you know, yeah. The concept of having fun in bars, which we are seeing, I mean, whether it's, you know, 70s style bars, Pepe Le Moco, and, you know, yeah, you you can Cadillac. have personal rules, you can have integrity, you can do things the way you want to do them. People will appreciate that. This All right, so uh, last question. Uh, With respect to um, love, hate, and rules, and your own self-rules, there's a lot of opportunity for self-expression, creativity, nurturing. But what about the legal implications that are put on bartenders today, serving the general public, and what they're responsible for when they leave a bar, do you feel as if that has an impact on the decision to enter into that career or the impact on the success of a person in that career nowadays versus years ago? Hopefully, well, in all aspects of life, you take responsibility for your actions. Uh, in Idaho, it's actually the bar's fault, not the bartender's fault. So if you want to go there, you could. <laughs> but, uh, and you know, when I, that was, you know, when I started writing, it was also about under, not necessarily under consumption, but responsible consumption. So, I mean, to me, and I always tell people, I don't drink enough, meaning that 
cocktails for me or drink for me is about a transition in, in, in a time in the day or mood or week or whatever. And it's not meant to be, I'm putting my foot on the gas and going all the way. I mean, this is a great you know, blowout weekend here at Tails, but hopefully people don't live like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about I, that. I, I honestly but, think it's the, it's the hardest thing we do. Is, it's the hardest thing we have to do as bartenders is to enforce that sense of, of it's really the hardest thing we do. because and, and if you live in the city like New York, it's a little easier, but, you know, it, it's, there's, you just have to buckle down and say, you're not getting another drink. That's it. I love you, but you're not getting another drink. And you got to have the guts to do that with even your friends, with anybody. You can't. It's, it's the hardest thing we do, really. I mean, and there's, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. And people off is the hardest part. But and the $25 cab ride or whatever it is is pretty cheap, to be honest, if, if you're truly concerned. So. Yeah, true. Personally, I think people who <laughs> go out drinking just to get drunk are like people who have sex just to get pregnant, really. That's sort of <laughs> missing a whole world of pleasurable opportunity and things like that. But still, folks, I'd like to wrap this one up now by saying thank you very much to Brother Cleve, Dale DeGroff, Paul Harrington for sharing their wisdom. Can spend some time with you?